Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hedge Fund Tips video cast podcast for the week ending April 10th, 2020. Uh, it's Good Friday, and we've got a lot to cover, but we're going to try to do it quickly this week because uh, we know everyone is busy with holidays and family, etc., even if it's through Zoom or social distancing. Uh, so first off, again, this is the 25th weekly video cast, the 15th podcast hedge fund tips with tom hayes so let's get started uh first i'd like to thank liz clayman and ellie terrett for having me on fox business the clayman countdown on monday um you can watch that here or under featured on we'll go into a little bit of it in the article so thanks a shout out to them this was really exciting the article that we're going to cover this week is the Rodney Atkins keep on going stock market and sentiment results. And I put it out yesterday and Rodney Atkins himself apparently must have been Google alerted because I didn't even tag him on the article and he just retweeted it today uh, to all of his articles. He's a country music absolute legend. I've been a fan of his forever. We used his song in the article and uh, he said he's never seen the use of his song, If You're Going Through Hell, this way yet. Thanks, Hedge Fund Tip. So really cool, Rodney Atkins. Uh, that was definitely the highlight uh, of my week. Very, very cool. So let's get down to the article itself. And uh, each week I do try to tie the, the theme of the stock market to a song that embodies the feeling of the moment. And the last month, uh, if you've been in the markets, you know uh, it could be best defined by Rodney Atkins' lyrics in his classic hit, If You're Going Through Hell. And the lyrics uh, are, if you're going through hell, keep on going, don't slow down. If you're scared, don't show it. You might get out before the devil even knows you're there. Uh, so we'll just kick, off, kick it off with a few words from Rodney and then get right down to the meat and potatoes. When you learn the truth If you're going through hell Keep on going Don't slow down If you're scared Don't show it You might get out For the devil even knows you're there Okay, so that's that And um, so what The point that I'm making with His great lyrics Is, is it possible That we got out Before the devil even knew we were there I mean, look at this hellish experience from late February through uh, late mid to late March. In just a few weeks, the markets fell about 35% peak to trough, and we've since rebe rebounded well over 20% um, in the last couple of weeks. And what's interesting is when we did this first bounce and on the video cast last week, I made the case to be alert for the fact that there was a really consensus chorus of conviction that we would go back and retest the lows because if, historically, if you look back, that's a common thing to do. And I was overwhelmed with the amount of certainty that many, many participants had in, in that guarantee that we would go back to test the lows. And when everyone's looking for the same thing, rationally and logically, based on history, it's usually when you don't get it. And I'm not saying that it's it's out of the question by any stretch of the imagination, but what the point that I made on last week's video cast podcast was that based on that level of conviction, the more likely probability was number one, uh, that we just keep grinding higher and not letting anyone in. And so far that's been the case. Or number two, if we were to go back and retest the lows, we'd flush well below them to flush out all the people that were buying the retest. Uh, so the further we get away from those lows, the lower the probability that we get the flush through the lows um, to to take everyone out. Uh, I, I think the you know the the perfect historical retest is is a very low probability, but uh, a flush is still on the cards in the cards and right now also though you have to keep in mind the pain trade which is designed to you know fool the most of the people the most of the time and that's what the market tries to do is higher people are not positioned to it 
uh, positioned for it and we're going to cover a uh, chart done by sentiment charts towards the end of this video cast that shows that people were just getting out of stocks in the past week as it climbed and there was another guy on uh, CNBC talking about actually no it was a lady talking about um, this week as the market rallied people were not chasing with calls they were actually buying downside protection uh the like nine to one so very rarely does the market reward the consensus view to get protection usually what the market does is it's going to take the action that's going to flush all that premium down the drain and we talked about that actually in past uh, weeks and and it's proven to be accurate so um something to keep in mind now many people are going to say to me well are your eyes closed do you have a blindfold on we're going to contract 30 percent of gdp uh in q2 some people are now you know it's there are estimates between 15 percent and now 40 percent different different houses on on the street are you blind to the fact that all these people are dying and more people are going to die? Are you blind to the fact that it's it's not just New York, even though New York is getting a lot better and the case curve is, has come down quite a bit, that it's going to go city by city and it's going to go on forever and we're never going to be able to, to reopen the economy? Uh, not only am I aware of that, so is the rest of the world and the collective participants of the stock market. So that's what's known. And... In this argument, I talked about this reminding me of the December massacre, December 2018, when the Fed was actually raising rates too fast and unnecessarily stunted the economy at that time. Now, I was tough on them then, and I'm going to say now, and we're going to go into it in this video cast podcast, that there's no execution more perfect than what we've seen in the last two weeks from both the Treasury and the Fed that could be any better than what they've done. I mean, we would be so all of the things that that skeptical and, and bearish people would present that we just went over the whole laundry list from the health side to the economy side. They are putting things in place to cushion that blow as much as humanly possible. And I've never seen the amount of thoughtful and adept execution to bring these type of programs to bear. It's staggering. And we're going to we're going to go through the details. So just looking at what happened in 2018, and this is one example because all the people that are waiting for the retest are going to say, yeah, but the vast majority throughout history as they were saying in December of 2018, when we were getting aggressively long, is that uh, most flush lows retest. And I don't know if this is a function of the algorithms now that, you know, historically humans would buy weakness and sell strength. And now the algorithms, which control a lot of the flow, they actually sell weakness and buy strength. So that's why these things get overextended to the downside and then they don't let anyone in on the upside. Overextended to the downside and so far not really letting letting people in on the upside. Um, but everyone was waiting for the shoe to drop. And I, I mean, I remember every step up here. I remember being at Disneyland, Disney World on Christmas Eve when this thing was just blowing apart and buying TNA call options uh, three and six months out, that's a triple leverage small cap because I just couldn't, it was so unnatural the amount of selling that was happening. And when you look back, it looks like nothing, but um, every step along the way, there were just these really strong arguments about the next shoe to drop, the next shoe to drop, the next shoe to drop, and it never did. And then here, this, this is when everyone said the bull market is over. Uh, and we just kept climbing and it was a 42% move in uh, 14 months. So I'm not saying this is on the table because obviously the economic conditions in the short term are going to be atrocious. But I think those comparing it to a depression are going to be disappointed because 
the both the depression and 2008 you had really severe underlying credit conditions building up to those protracted downturns that had to unwind decades of uh, excess and we had that in 2008 so I think Ben Bernanke explained it the former Federal Reserve chairman explained it best when he said yeah he's expecting an enormous contraction maybe 30 percent this quarter but he's not expecting a depression he is ex he likens it to a natural disaster like a hurricane or a tornado or a flood that is quantified in timing and with the correct policy measures in place to fill that hole in the short term the economy can then go ahead and recover you know back back to new levels and i think that's what we're going to see and it's just a question of timing and that that does all come down to the case curve so we've covered the retest argument i i mean it nothing is out of the question because the numbers are going to get materially worse before they get better so we could get a, a flush below like a normal bear market so you know i've talked about what if you had actually bought in october of 2008 right after lehman crashed here and then you got the bear market bounce and then by march you were down here so it corrected another 10 or 20 percent below the lows uh you looked silly in the short term but if you're buying high quality and taking a long view one to three years by June of 2009, less than a year later, you looked like a genius because the market had rallied 43% off the bottom. And even though you didn't buy the perfect bottom, um, you were well into profits, just not, you know, about nine months later. So that, that's the way we've thought about it. And in the last four weeks, we've talked about buying the highest quality companies like Wells Fargo was down 52%, peak to trough, Cisco was down 35%. Uh, United Technology slash Raytheon were down over 50%, 56%. JP Morgan was down 42%. Pfizer was down 27%, uh, probably closer to 30% peak to trough. Uh, Coke was down 40% peak to trough, and, and the S&P was down 35 So that's where the real value was. Now we've had this monster rally off the bottom. Our, the, that dynamic has changed, and you're going to see our message change a little bit here this week as to where the opportunity is left. But let's go on to some of the analogies that I used on, on TV with Liz this week. And uh, I also did another show, but that won't air until Sunday. So we'll get that link out on Monday. Um, so there were two things. And this is why, despite the economic news getting materially worse, that it's, there's a potential not a guarantee that there's a potential that we put in the stock market, we put in the bottom for the stock market, even though the economic numbers are going to get a lot worse in the short term. So what I explained to Liz, uh, what, what I um, answered Liz's question on the show was that the market is a discounting mechanism. So just as we crashed 35% in February and March, anticipating the bad news that is to come, both on the deaths, both on the case count, the case curve, which, by the way, has shown to be better than expected. In New York, we're four weeks ahead of schedule in terms of the apex. Um, that the market will also start to discount the recovery many months before the worst of the economic news. So we crashed before, before the bad news came. And we'll rally before the good news comes. So you have to assume Q2 is going to be horrible, economically speaking. So the, the, the earnings is going to be bad. The guidance is going to be bad. The GDP contraction is going to be bad. The pessimism is going to be high. The outlook is going to be bad. And the market will bottom before the news starts to get good. Uh, and the news starts to get better. And that's what we may be starting to see. And And part of that's a function of um the couple analogies that i'm going to share with you here and the first one that i use is that the federal reserve 
learned the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the government policymakers learned a lot from the great financial crisis of 2008. And that is that we all know that the table, the, the plate is falling off the kitchen table. We can see that that's happening. OK, and the plate being a metaphor for the economy. That's happening in 2008. What happened was everyone said. These were bad actors, Lehman Brothers, let them crash, let them go bankrupt, let it be a free market, let it be capitalism. And I'm not going to argue with that argument, but there are consequences to that position. The consequences are when you see the plate is falling off the table and you say, let it crash, that's capitalism, that's free market. So Lehman crashes, it takes years and years and years to glue the plate back together. OK, what they're doing now is with the CARES Act, with the 13-3 carve out, which we're going to cover in detail on this uh, podcast video cast, is they're saying this plate's falling off the table rather than let it crash and taking years to put it all glue it back together. And then it's never quite the same anyway. Let's do this. Let's put a trampoline down underneath the table so the plate will fall, but it will also bounce back okay it's going to bounce off that and then we can gently catch it as it bounces up and gently place it back on the table and rather than spend three years of gluing it back together after it's already broken we will cushion the blow and gently gently place it back together and that is what they've done this time that they've never done before they didn't do it in the great depression they didn't do it in 1973-74 all the biggest crashes uh, they didn't see it coming in, in 87 per se, although I would liken this closer to, to 1987 because the underlying economy was strong. It just was a short term 33 percent correction. And then it took a year, year and a half to get to new highs in the stock market, which is a long time, by the way. And it may be the case that this time, you know, we may grind around and take some time to build a bottom It's quite possible. We won't make new highs for a year, year and a half out, may, maybe even longer. Uh, but. My second analogy that I'm going to share with you may change that view. And that is not only do they see the plate falling off the table and they're cushioning the blow so that it can bounce back up gently. But if you consider the estimated contraction of GDP, which are depression like levels, which is why you're getting the comparison to the Great Depression of 30 percent contraction, 10, 15, 20, uh, 10 to 15 percent unemployment in the short term. Um, the total estimate of that loss, so let's just take 30% GDP contraction. Let's go with the real pessimist for Q2. If we have a $20 trillion economy, which is $5 trillion a quarter, and you take a 30% contraction in Q2, so let's call that 30% of $5 trillion is a trillion and a half dollars. Let's say it goes on longer than expected, uh, although there were some announcements today that are going impl to imply that we might be able to open the economy sooner than expected, but let's leave that aside. So let's say it takes a quarter and a half or two quarters of massive contraction. So instead of, you know, on the conservative side, a trillion dollars of a pothole economic contraction, let's say we have two to three trillion dollars of economic contraction, meaning two quarters of 20 to 30 percent GDP contraction, which would be unprecedented in history. Um, but let's just say that came to bear. Let's look at the worst case scenario. So let's let's call it two to three trillion dollars of lost economic activity. What they've basically done with the CARES Act, the two point three trillion dollar uh, stimulus or aid stimulus and recovery and aid bill that that was passed uh, not last Friday, but the Friday before that. The majority of that goes to individuals extending unemployment checks for families, a family of four can check will be up to 3,900 and those are going to start being received in the next week, week and a half. Um, loans to small businesses. If you keep people on payroll, you get two and a half months of uh, payroll plus utilities plus rent as a grant the the loan will be forgiven if you keep people on payroll so basically transferring people from the unemployment roles back to the business roles so as the economy opens you don't have the lag in getting production back up okay so this week 
they ex extended. It was part of the 2.3 trillion. They explained how they were going to leverage about 486 billion of 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 the 2.3 trillion into another four trillion dollars of loans for municipalities okay their their credit markets for uh businesses that did not qualify under the program that i just explained for small businesses the payroll protection program the ppp uh how do you since since the small businesses and individuals were the first priority and those were covered in the first bill how are you going to help the businesses that were uh not the huge businesses like boeing and the airlines that are going to be covered through the first part of the bill but the medium-sized businesses that um are over 500 employees but not more than uh, 10,000 employees and under 2.5 billion dollars of revenue because remember smallish businesses employ over 50 percent of uh of the population so they explain that and and they're going to be able to lever that 486 billion of the 2.3 into four trillion dollars of loans to municipalities and to those mid-sized businesses and we're going to explain all the components of that in this um in just a second so the 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 point that we made about how the market is a discounting mechanism so so you you effectively have a maximum of 2 to 3 trillion dollars of economic contraction you take the 2.3 trillion dollar cares act you take the 4 trillion dollars of this loan expansion which we're going to discuss so now you're at 6.3 trillion the federal reserve has increased their balance sheet by over 2 trillion dollars since august Half of that's been in the last couple of weeks. So now you're up to about $8 trillion of liquidity. And you've got another bill in the works for $250 billion just to, to make more loans available to small businesses. And there's another bill in the works for $1 to $2 trillion of infrastructure. So, so you're basically now at a point where you've got over $8, billion, $8 trillion of liquidity and aid already authorized and in the, in the works. You've got another one to two trillion dollars of stimulus because we've got the recovery money out, basically, that could take us up to ten trillion dollars. So if you take a worst case economic contraction, let's not take one trillion or one and a half trillion, which is probably what it'll be, but let's take three trillion, two quarters of thirty percent GDP contraction. Disaster. Three trillion dollars. You've got eight to ten trillion dollars of asphalt or stimulus to fill in that hole, that contraction, okay? And that's why when knowing people talk about how the recovery could be massive, in effect, more than it would have been if the growth levels being well more than they would have been had this not happened, as we, after we get through the health issue, the, cal the, the case curve, and Liz Clayman made a very important point on that that's critical that is something in some sense that we can't control but now that it's going better than expected there's there's a lot much more visibility which is why the market's up 20 30 percent off the lows but i want you to just have this analogy clearly in mind the maximum pothole economic pothole is two to three trillion and we already have eight trillion with potentially one to two trillion more on the way so you're filling that pothole with eight to ten trillion dollars of asphalt so picture that in your mind two to three trillion dollar pothole fill it with eight to ten trillion dollars of asphalt you have a surplus of six to eight trillion dollars of excess stimulus and aid that's going into the economy that may not even be required so as we get through the other side of the health issue that amount of stimulus may lead to a long-term boom of the likes that we've never seen in history. And a good analogy of assuming debt levels, because there are all these people like, well, then why don't we just all do this? If we can just make magic money and you have that whole crew, and that's a reasonable point of view. But I think the wartime analogy is accurate. We do have an invisible enemy killing tens of thousands of people, which is, you know, more than many, you know, quite a few wars, certainly recent wars. 
uh, it's it's a much larger number than that, especially on a global basis. So this is this is a war. And the last time we got the debt levels near this high were the mid to late 40s for World War II. And we had a massive boom from 1950 to 1968 following that, those levels of debt. So keep in mind, the other aspect is we're borrowing at much lower rates than was the case in during World War II. So we're basically, you know, borrowing at levels that can sustain this in the short term and can be easily absorbed over the long term. Now, will we have to be more austere moving forward as we get through this and growth happens? Of course, the liquidity is going to be taken down once we start to see whiffs in, of inflation. Uh, you know, taxes will probably go up over time as we get growth. Remember, we could sustain tax high taxes in the 90s when we had high growth levels. So once that growth machine gets going, we'll be able to more normalize our balance sheet and more normalize our, our debt to GDP ratios. But right now in an emergency, you could say, okay, well, you know, that's capitalism. Let everyone just go homeless and hungry. And we could do that. It's just going to cost us 10 or 20 years of progress. So, you know, we can go with that plan that they did in, in the 30s. And yes, I know they tried to stimulate, but they, they stimulated after the fact. After the plate fell off the table, was broken on the ground, they spent the next 20 years gluing it together, and they effectively got out of it with a, war, a World War II. So being that people actually, some people actually learn from history, and fortunately we have some leadership that seems to be showing that, um, we don't want to wait 10 years, and we don't want to have to have a war to get out of this. So rather than do that, deal with the problem beforehand it's like an avoid it's avoiding a crash before you get into one i mean that that's the basis of, of what's happening here so i hope those two analogies are helpful the pothole filling the pothole with the excess asphalt and putting the trampoline down before the plate breaks if you keep those two in mind as the negative news comes out and as the bad numbers continue to come in coming weeks and as the tragedy, and, and I'm not underestimating the, the human tragedy that this is, but this is an economic podcast, so I acknowledge that. I I feel for it. I'm right in the epicenter, New York and Connecticut. Everyone knows people who are uh, affected by this, have caught coronavirus, have recovered from coronavirus, and people who have died from coronavirus. It's It's terrible. I don't think anyone's seeing any silver lining in what happened, other than the fact we'll be prepared in the future, but... It's a disaster from the health sense. I'm just trying to explain how I'm looking at the economic. And I'm not saying that, you know, my view is right or it's the only one. I'm just laying out a context. And you can say I disagree with that context and I see things more negatively for X, Y, Z reason. And, and then you should go with that view. But I, I'm trying to deal dispassionately with the facts and trying to navigate through the, be the best we can and uh and so far we're we're doing a good job of that so um okay so the other thing so you know as in the last four weeks if you've been following me if you haven't been you can just click here on the right side to sentiment and it brings up all of the articles that all the weekly articles that we've ever done so you can just track what we've been saying but the point that I was making the last four weeks when I was saying buy the highest quality stocks that are down more than the indices, you know, 40 to 60 percent stayed boring companies that have been around for decades and will be around for decades to come. Not high flyer Momo stocks that this is not the time for that. There will come a time for that in the future uh, is Warren Buffett. And what Warren Buffett says is if you wait until the Robins are, Robins are singing, it's already spring. So Robin sing, singing being the good news, if you wait for the good news and you wait for the all clear sign, you miss the benefit of you only get the bargain the discount the benefit of of assuming the risk when it's uncertain when things are certain you don't get a discount markets are efficient you can only get the discount when things look darkest and when things are the most uncertain and things are the riskiest and your hedge against that uncertainty and that darkness is two things number one you never buy anything on margin that just goes without saying so if you're doing that I'm, I'm not a person worth listening to your hedge is time so in recent podcasts i've talked about you know wells fargo being down 52 percent 
I mean, it's since rebounded huge, but is Wells Fargo two years down the road going to be half the business that it is today? Is it going to do 50% loans, 50% less loans two years from now than it did last year? And if you don't, if you think that's extreme, then you may want to get some exposure. Now, you know, skeptics will say, well, the multiple will change because the growth will slow. And yeah, but when you have such a large margin of safety of a 52% discount on a high quality, durable franchise, you sometimes you just have to step in. You can't wait for the Robin, Robins to sing or you've missed it. So um, same thing with JP Morgan, best in class. Same thing with Coca-Cola. Are people going to drink 40% less Coca-Cola around the world two years from now? Is the population going to grow or is it going to decrease two years from now? And you could say, well, no, you're, we're going to have more pandemics and we're going to lose half the population. Well, if you think that way, then, you know, this is probably not the right game for you. But if if you think that it's likely over time they'll grow at their in line with their long term mean uh, and vacillate modestly around to the upside and the downside, I want to have exposure at 40 percent discount for a business that will probably be larger two years from now than it is today. And there were numerous of those available. And there's still some some of those available, but but less so. So, um, number one, you never trade on margin, and number two, you always keep dry powder so that if the bargains become available again, which they might, maybe we blow through the lows, you're in a position to benefit with your hedge being what? Your hedge being time. Okay. Again, if you bought in fall October of 2008. You were wrong for four months. You looked silly. But if your hedge was time and you had a one to three year view. Nine months later in June, you looked like a genius. Two years later, you were a super genius. Numerous years later, you made not just 50 or 100%. You made, in some cases, 200, 300, 400%. So um, that's how you hedge, and you don't have to be perfect. You don't trade on margin, and you don't worry about getting the low. If you buy it, and it falls lower, and the thesis hasn't changed, you can add we buy on red days, we sit on our hands on green days during these volatile periods. And that's what we did through that period. And in the last week, we've changed our focus. And we're going to discuss that at, at the end of this. But um, I just wanted to really drill that, down those two analogies and um, tie it up with a nice bow from Warren Buffett, which he always tends to take very complex subjects and simplify them. Now, for those of you saying, well, he sold some airlines, it was a modest portion of his position, and maybe maybe airlines have real business risk, but I think they're coming out with some type of package to help the airlines. Um, this weekend, I think it was mentioned at the conference call today or uh, yesterday, the press conference with the administration, and he sold uh, some percent of, um, I think, BNY. But he sold that because he needed to stay, you know, a lot of times these headlines, oh, Warren's selling banks. Warren only sells banks to keep below the 10% regulatory filing uh, to keep him in compliance. So when he's selling, you can always see he's taking it down to 9.9 or 9.8% because the stock appreciated. So he's taking it off. So he's within that 10%, not because he's dumping out of the stock. And as far as the airlines, uh, he lightened up two things. I would say, number one, you have to be careful nowadays because he has a couple portfolio managers working under him. And often the small trades, in this case, it was a few hundred million dollars of airlines, is his subordinates that are actually more, um, their styles are a little different than Warren Buffett's. So, uh, you know, when they bought Restoration Hardware, I remember I was on Liz's show and last year and um you know number one it had already appreciated like a hundred percent and they bought the quarter before so i you know whether it was a buy and at that case i said you know number one they probably bought it um 50 percent lower than now it's already up a hundred percent in the last three months and number two it was like a few hundred million dollars which means it wasn't warren it was one of his uh lieutenants and which is fine, but, you know, look at the sizing of the positions before you determine who it is. It's likely not Warren if it's if it's a buy or sell under a billion dollars. It's his lieutenants, and he has to do that for succession reasons 
to give them that autonomy to do it. But don't be misled that it's the Oracle. It's probably not. It's the lieutenant, one or two of the lieutenants of the Oracle who are great investors, obviously, or they wouldn't be working for him. But it's, you know, somewhat different style and maybe kind of shorter term in mindset because they're measured and compensated a different way than Warren is, which is predominantly through stock. Okay, so uh, when I put this, uh, and just to tie up those two things, you know, the one thing I couldn't understand through the past four weeks as we were buying when it was really, really negative, and, and I, I remember going on a number of times on different shows and feeling pushback, you know, when I was saying, you know, we're buying the highest quality stocks with the with the long term view, just kind of like skepticism, like, how can you do that when you don't know what the health situation and the answer is, I don't know, and I'm not a doctor, but what I do know is human ingenuity, you never bet against America and you never bet against human ingenuity. We do know there are a number of treatments, that's the core thing in the that are working anecdotally and also nearing endpoints of major tests where we'll get a binary yes or no for broad approval. All of these are being used for compassionate care. So we have short-term solutions. Well, you know, we're getting new information on vaccines, which we'll need for the end of the year. Um, but I wasn't looking for whether it was going to go down more the next day. Because if it went down more the next day, I'd just buy more. And some we bought a little too early. We bought more down. And then we bought as it came up. So you score that way. Your dollar cost average, you still have an unbelievable gain. Not to say that we're going to just keep going higher. I'm hoping that we get a break to, to add more because the risk reward now to adding a lot of new stocks here is not the same as it was when we were doing it over the last four weeks. So we've shifted gears and we're going to talk about what we've shifted to in the last week. But um, And I'm not saying we're out of the woods at all and I, and I think I've emphasized this. Now, I put this article out as I do every Thursday morning around 7 a.m. after the uh, sentiment survey results come out from the uh, American Association of Individual Investors. And I said that on Wednesday morning, Secretary Mnuchin discussed a new aspect to the CARES stimulus action uh, package for businesses between 500 to 10,000 employees that are non-investment grade high yield. This has been a major reason that the equity markets crashed so quickly and so fast. First, it was the repo market, which they shored up with the uh, uh, open market operations. And then it was the mortgage-backed security markets. And they came in in the last two weeks and bought $1.4 trillion of mortgage-backed securities, the Fed did. So I saw that they were basically backstopping every single as asset class. They started across the treasury curve, then they moved into mortgage-backed securities and CMBS. But the biggest one that was hit in rattling the markets, which we've covered in the last three or four video casts, was the high, high yield credit market. And the high yield credit market got hammered when the OPEC meeting went bust. And then it was compounded, the first OPEC meeting, where everyone thought they were going to do a million and a half barrel a, a day cuts. And then they, uh, Russia, uh, basic Russia and Saudi got into a fight. And then you got a mass demand destruction on top of it with coronavirus. So energy is a major weighting in the high yield market. So when energy collapsed due to that breakdown in the meeting, the credit markets destabilize. And when the credit markets destabilize and funding becomes tight and companies can't borrow because everyone's worried about the knock-on effects of all the defaults in the energy sector, they stop lending to other companies that are less than investment grade, and it stops the flow of credit. So the natural progression after they stabilized um, uh, the overnight funding market to then, then they were buying across the treasury curve to push money out on the risk, uh, on the risk curve into equities. Then everyone was worried about people not paying their mortgages and their rent, so they started stabilizing the mortgage-backed security market and the asset back to keep credit flowing to consumers, receivables, credit cards, uh, car loans, etc., packaged uh, mortgage bonds. The next step where the most pain that was causing the most pain was the high yield market. And that's why I put this out. Well, sure enough, uh, literally an hour and a half after I put out 
the article, they did announce, I said something was in the works because he had signaled that the day before in this interview. Uh, they put that out as a carve out of Section 13.3. So basically the Fed can leverage the the part of the CARES Act allocated for business loans, call it $400 billion for round numbers, 10 to 1. So it multiplies to $4 trillion provided they have the authority authorization of the treasury secretary which they do in this case secretary mnuchin and these both chair powell and secretary mnuchin uh have just been geniuses in how quickly they've moved and how surgically they've moved and how correct their thinking has been about what was needed to stabilize the credit markets which would then stabilize the equity markets which then can get business back to work once we get through the virus so kuda like MVPs all around. Obviously, Larry Kudlow has been exceptionally involved in this, working day and night, um, uh, and and many people in the administration. So, just I know it's hard to see it right now, but when we look back on how we were able to get through what would be, if this was neglected, it would be worse than the Great Depression. Okay, if if we went with, well, it's capitalism. So what if there's a tsunami? Let everyone starve and wait on on bread lines. Um, yeah, it would be a depression. It would be worse than a depression because the numbers would be staggering if if we didn't use the power of the government to fill that pothole before you broke the axle. Um, it would it would be game over. But that's not the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, we're just the opposite. We're filling a two to three trillion dollar pothole with eight to ten trillion dollars of asphalt. Okay. So how this works. And I'm going to go through the different components. And I covered, you know, showed you on the Federal Reserve balance sheet how they went into mortgage-backed securities. And that was the signal that they were going to be moving into the high-yield market, which is why we've been buying in the high-yield market. Um, one of the reasons we've been buying. The other reason was that as the markets rebounded, whatever it is, I think it's probably 25%, maybe 30% off the lows now, uh, some of the high-yield bonds that not the ones that have been impaired since before the coronavirus, but the ones that have fallen from par down to, you know, 30%, 40%, even 60% in four weeks as a result of business shutting down. That's where the real opportunity is. And those are the areas that are going to be helped by this program. And some of them are yielding 20, 30% current yield. Yield to maturity is obviously a lot more because you're going to get a recovery to par over, over coming years or sooner if they, if the bonds get called or refinanced. But you're going to have some of these move, you know, the bond itself is going to move 100%. And in the interim, while you're waiting, you're going to be collecting 20 to $30, uh, 30% premiums on your money. Uh, that kind of narrowed quite a bit in, uh, after this was announced Thursday. So we were able to get some exposure uh during the previous week um and there's still opportunity there because some are below different credit ratings which you'll see but that's that's where we're focused now that equities have moved up so so far from where they were at discount levels and keeping enough dry powder in case we do take a leg leg lower that we can participate again what is our hedge our hedge is time we're not trying to get the perfect price we're trying to get high quality businesses at steep discounts in the case of high yield in the high yield market we don't have to go for the highest quality businesses because we're more senior in the capital structure. So in the event that they did go bankrupt, uh, you would still have recovery. Either the bonds would be converted to equity or when the assets were sold off, you would get some payout and um, you have to look at it on a security by security basis. Is the play to buy the junk or the high yield uh, ETF? No, 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 absolutely not, because you're not going to get the benefit of um, discrete discounts on a company by company basis. And as you saw, once this was announced, I think it was bid up six or eight percent on Thursday. I wasn't even looking at it, but I heard on the TV it was going up dramatically. So, which which is a huge move for the index. Um. Okay, so let me just walk you through quickly the components of this program, because in my view, as we look back, it's going to prove to be the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of saving a country from a depression and potentially, I would say, creating a U-ish, 
potentially V-shaped recovery provided we get the health thing under control, which looks like we, we may be doing. Okay, so um, here was the announcement. It came at 8.30 a.m. You'll see the article uh, was tweeted out at 7 a.m. or 7.10 a.m., so it came right after. Um, okay, so first they have the tal TALF. This is going to be, um, they're taking uh, $10 billion and multiplying it to $100 billion to buy auto loans, student loans, credit card receivables, floor plan loans, uh, insurance premium finance loans, small business loans guaranteed by the SBA, commercial mortgage and leverage loans. So that's the first component. That's $100 billion there. They take $10 billion, turn it into $100. Second component is primary market corporate credit facility. So this is going to help. They're taking uh, $75 billion and levering it up to $750 billion. And that's going to help those less than investment grade companies with 500 to 10,000 employees and less than two and a half billion of revenue that uh, was rated at least triple B minus or BAA three by two or more ratings agencies as of March 22nd. So they're not taking defaulted bankrupt companies and making them solvent. They're taking companies that were impaired but you know these are the bonds that i'm talking about that fell as a result of coronavirus shutting businesses down and they were doing just fine before the country chose to shut down proactively to save the health not by any fault of their own of being bad actors which was the argument in 2008 well these people were reckless with their housing loans and doing that that was a reasonable argument it was still the wrong decision to to, to let it crash and then try to piece humpty dumpty back together again uh, but the argument was more cogent here. These are all victims like this is not something that anyone is like, oh, well, you didn't prepare prepare for a worldwide pandemic like you should have had two years of savings. You're a bad actor. And in capitalism, that means you should go out of business and lose everything you built for the last 30 years because you weren't pre preparing for a six standard deviation event. Uh, that That's a little bit. I mean, that's what the purists would say. Uh, you know, I, I'm not in that camp. God bless them if they think that's helpful to humanity. Um, and it's just a different point of view. And I respect that. But it's it's not where I stand in a situation like this. I actually believe that it was an outlier event that, that people could, couldn't really hedge and protect for. Um, whereas maybe you could say, argue 2008, they certainly could. They could have seen the writing on the wall, the recklessness, the greed, etc. That's kind of a different argument. Although... Looking back, we should still potentially could have handled it better um, and had a much quicker recovery. But leaving that aside, it is what it is. So that's the primary. So they'll be able to issue uh, new debt up to $750 billion, these type of companies. The second part of this is the secondary market where the facility is also going to be $750 billion and they can purchase corporate bonds uh, in the open market, secondary market that again meet the same criteria, the 500, uh, 500 to 10,000 employees, less than two and a half billion of revenues, and had credit ratings of um, of these levels by as of March 22nd. So that is just huge, and you saw it. You know, the junk index jumped. You saw individual high yield bonds jumping 20, 30 percent. Some of the equities of some of these companies that are going to qualify were up literally between like 10% and 50% yesterday. Some of these smaller cap companies, 50% uh, plus, it, it was just staggering. Then there's going to be a facility for municipalities that are obviously going to have shortages of cash flow due to uh, tax revenues down, people not being able to pay, pay property taxes, expenses related to coronavirus. They've got $500 billion available there. Then they've got the... PPP program, which we already covered, if you keep people on, uh, you, the loan is forgiven. Uh, then there's a new Main Street loan facility, which is up to $600 billion. This is going to be four-year loans. It's basically the overnight lending rate plus 250 to 400 basis points, which is much better than market rate. And it's going to be up to $25 million loans for these companies that we already delineated. And then this is the Main Street Expanded Loan Facility, which is the same criteria, another $600 billion, and again, below market rates, and the uh, loan can go up to $150 million or 
30% of the eligible borrowers existing outstanding and committing uh, undrawn bank debt or an amount when added to the eligible borrowers uh, does not exceed six times EBITDA. Okay, so they're saying we'll help you get through this, but if you're already excessively over levered, we can't help you. Uh, but if you're reasonably over levered, we will help you provided your rating is within that range that assures us as the economy recovers, you're going to be solvent to pay us back. And that is the program and that is what's going to basically save this economy and take the D word off the table. Uh, potentially, obviously, we'll have a recession. We know that uh, whether how it falls, if it fits the technical definition of two quarters of contraction, my guess is it will, but it may be the shortest deepest recession we've ever had with the quickest recovery so long as we get the health thing and we'll we'll just cover quickly here at the end some of the things they announced today on the health front so i really wanted to go through the granularity of this program because it's the most innovative thoughtful uh solution oriented dealing with the exact problem program ever designed uh in the history of government policy in my view uh, if you can find something else, please let me know. I'm always open to learning, but this was just blew my mind to, to put it mildly. On top of that, the other thing that was obviously ailing the credit markets was the oil industry, obviously demand destruction, the price war. Well, well, they agreed to do OPEC agreed to do OPEC plus rather agreed to do 10 million barrel per day cut in May and June. Okay. Uh, then they'll do 8 million of barrels per day for the rest of 2020, which is just staggering because you got to assume that demand is going to be coming back late Q3, early Q4 into these cuts. And not only that, they're going to do 6 million barrels per day for all of 2021 and through April of 2022, according to the OPEC statement down here. This is just staggering. And I think what this does no one can see this right now, but I think we get back to that beautiful equilibrium where the producers win and the consumers win, and that's between $58 to $72 WTI. It's not going to happen in 2020, probably not going to happen in early 2021, but I could certainly see it by back half of 2021 with demand coming back and this level of cuts and commitment globally coordinated. Um, uh, not to mention all the all of the rigs that have been already taken offline. It could set the stage to a real recovery. And according to the EIA, this is staggering. It's worth 50, 50 million jobs globally are tied to the energy industry. So this is going to be critical for the U.S. economy, our energy independence, um, keeping probably in the U.S. it's a few million ancillary related jobs in the energy industry. This was really good news. Now, do we go to $40 on Monday? Probably not because there's no demand right now. But the table is set as we get the health thing done, as the demand picks up with this level of cuts over such a long period of uh, period committed. You know, it would be this is so much more valuable. They could have come in and said, we're going to do 20 million barrels a day cuts for the next three months until the next OPEC meeting. That's useless because then at the next OPEC meeting, you have another fight and it doesn't work and or they don't do it or someone doesn't want to participate or whatever or someone has a political consideration because they have an election coming and it just blows it up. Here, we've got a guide path now. We understand what supply is going to be. All we have to do is focus on demand and this is just really healthy for the credit markets, which filters through. And people are like, well, who cares about all these businesses? Because all these businesses employ everyone. So we have to keep that in mind that if these type of programs are not put into place in this period of dislocation, you have, you have the Great Depression. That's basically what happens. And it would probably be twice as bad. But instead, we have thoughtful leadership and policymakers who have learned from history and they're putting that trampoline down ahead of time and filling the pothole with way more asphalt than will ever be needed. So that's exciting. The other thing we had was the energy secretary. Uh, I know this was left out of the last bill, which is what's hurt oil in the last couple of weeks. But he was on, I think, Maria Bartiromo's show on April 6th. So I guess that was Tuesday morning. I caught a glimpse of it. And he said 
Energy Secretary Dan Bruyette, he's looking into reserving up to a billion barrels of oil through the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at the uh, direction of President Trump. Yeah, that was on Monday, Mornings with Maria. This is staggering. We know that there's only 77 million barrels storage capacity at present. We still haven't gotten the money from Congress. I think it will get in the next bill, or maybe they'll figure out a way to do it through this uh, program where they can get the money through the 13-3. I don't know if that would qualify or not, but it might because it would help uh, credit markets. But where they're going to find the storage to do more than 77 million barrels, I don't know if they'll rent it from energy companies or or maybe buy it and store it by the reserves potentially I, i'm not sure but uh with these cuts even if they just got the 77 million barrels in the short term got the three billion dollars from congress and then flipped it and made three billion for the taxpayers over the next year when the price normalizes that would be amazing but could you imagine if they start storing more than that um you know the tankers are almost filled up but they you know, maybe they just say, "Will we will purchase it from you at today's cash price, but you have to keep it stored in your, you know, basically it's still in your wells, but you owe it to us as we get through the SPR. You owe to refill our SPR eight times over the next five years. They could do something like that and feel free to correct me if that's for energy specialists, but... um I was shocked by that statement because I thought at most we'd get 77 million barrels and that fell apart in the first stimulus deal or phase three, whatever they called it, the CARES Act. Uh, I think it's coming in the next deal. They'll find a way to get the $3 billion from somewhere. Maybe maybe they could get it from the D Defense Department because it is a matter of national defense to be en energy independent. Um, but it looks like the 77 is in the bag. But if they're looking to go towards a billion that would be staggering and we would get normalized. I mean, we would boom and then you'd get um, everything else stabilizing. Okay, wanted to cover a few more things and we're done. There's just so much happening. I know these are can be long, but when there's so much happening in these type of periods, this was by Sentiment Trader. And this is what I covered. Everyone out, investors fled equity funds at the fastest pace in decades this week. So all these red dots are when people were fleeing out of equities, uh, weekly equity fund flow, mutual and exchange change traded funds. So you look at all these period of dots when people were just puking out of equities, what happened afterwards? Here, 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 and here. And this was the biggest week, even though we rallied whatever it was, 20, 25% off the bottoms, maybe 30% off the bottom. Certainly for some stocks, they're up 50 or 70% off the bottoms. But um, this level of outflow and what's happened historically. So thank you to Sentiment Trader for putting that out on Twitter. None of these are ever guaranteed. All you can do is trade probabilistically and statistically and when everyone's doing one thing and it gets extreme, you're often compensated for taking the risk and taking the uncertainty and taking the other side of the trade. And um, and these are examples of that. So then Miles Udlin put out put this chart from Helen Meister in his newsletter. If you don't have Miles Udlin's newsletter, just look him up on Twitter and he has a subscribe link. He wrote this article on March 15th. And this is a chart that's been going around for years. A lot of good uh, traders use it. In this case, Helene Meisler tweeted it, but this has been around forever, probably 10, 20 years. Different guys have been putting it, guys and gals have been putting it out. And it just talks about market sentiment. So you have enthusiasm, then you have panic. And the view in this article, which he was taking, which was certainly rational, was that we were kind of here where you had this bounce off of panic. Uh, and, uh, you know, consensus is that people were saying we were going to retest. But if you look historically, you could get to a period of discouragement and then it takes a long time and then you get anxiety and, and this and that. And this is d certainly worth considering. We could overshoot. That is a possibility. I think what's potentially different this time is the amount and the size of the trampoline. If it was purely human emotion and there was no one to rescue us, which has happened 
then this is guaranteed to happen because you just say, wow, things are cheap. And then you'd rally and you say, whoa, nothing's changed. The economy is still in the tank and everyone's going bankrupt and defaulting. And then you're here. Oh, my God, the world is over. And then, you know, all of a sudden things just everyone's already gone bankrupt and things start to come up here. And you say, oh, we've gotten ahead of ourselves. This is with no support and stimulus. This is the normal human emotion. Maybe you could look at this more clearly on a company by company basis. But with the level of um, stimulus in place, I think it shortcuts this whole choppy process where we got the aversion already and may, maybe we're we're there and we have to consolidate sideways because you know there's no reason to go to new highs overnight because obviously the economy is taking a, a big hit so um so that's that chart next thing i wanted to cover uh michael batnick did a re article that's just been in my head all week i i, I just thought it was the most really thoughtful article and it was short and sweet but I, I can't stop thinking about this phrase their rightful owners and he basically said quoted from this book about jp morgan in bear markets stocks return to their rightful owners and we saw that over the last four weeks and and uh, you know you if you're in the business you all had family members calling you to tell you when they were 30 percent down how they just sold their stocks because the world's going to hell and literally within two two days the market just ripped higher and that's always a tell and you can you know and they, they're calling you not to get advice they're calling you almost in some sense to convince you to do the same because they really are afraid that you're going into the abyss and when you explain well do you know what you own and you know are you sure you want to do that because if you look out two or three years do you think these businesses are going to be really badly impaired particularly because most people own you know large cap stocks if they're in an index um but that happened and so what michael batnick of ritholtz said was that how do stocks redistribute during a bear market jp morgan very famously said in bear markets stocks return to their rightful owners which unfortunately is wealthy people if the average 401k holder sells out of their stocks right now and the market goes down even further and they completely sell out or they sell out like they did in 2009 Who's on the other side of the transaction? Well, it's the one tenth of one percent. And he said that was an aha moment for him. Uh, it's unlikely that Morgan was thinking about the patient investor. He was thinking about himself, uh, et cetera. And he tells you the book. But just keep that in mind. You don't have to be the one tenth of one percent to have the one tenth of one percent mindset, which is um, to be thoughtful versus emotional, to be rational and look further down the road before you make a rational decision. Now, that's not to say that different people might have to make decisions in the short term. If you're retired or if you're just retiring or you're going to retire soon, maybe you have to be in you know different assets in the short term if you need access to the money. But if you have a five-year, 10-year, 15-year view, you know, you're 40, 50 years old, 30 years old, certainly 20 years old, I mean, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And if you're on a plan where you're buying every single month, a certain amount might you know do whatever you want and talk with your financial advisor but keep that going because it's periods like this where you're getting the real juice and you're buying cheaply for the long term inexpensively for the long term uh dollar cost averaging so you may buy and buy lower and buy lower and buy lower and buy lower but as that recovers over the long term um it's just a huge opportunity in situations like this so really try to stick with your plan even if your income's tight uh to to be benefiting from these opportunities so that was a really thought the right their rightful owners you can google it as his website is called the irrelevant investor but that one really stuck out great article and then howard marks he runs 120 billion dollars bond fund one of the smartest minds in uh in the markets he's a credit guy by the way distressed credit and he basically said, the bottom line for me is I'm not at all troubled saying markets may be considerably lower sometime in the coming months, but we're buying today when we find good value. So um, what I said at the end of the article this week, and we're not even going to go through the sentiment stuff, It's there's still a lot of fear in the market, which is good for to be net buyers. People are still underweight. But in the last four weeks, our message was to uh buy these discounted stocks and then uh, this week i said that because we've taken advantage of most of the best discounts that were available in equities we shifted our focus in the past week to start picking up selective portfolio of distressed high yield credit that has fallen material since the advent of covid 
19, i.e. some bonds have fallen as much as 40 to 60% in the past six weeks from par. There are selective pockets that have not recovered to the same extent as equity markets have. We believe that many of these securities will recover to par over time as credit markets repair and potentially government liquidity finds its way to this distressed corner of the market. Well, that happened an hour and a half later. Uh, we envision a scenario similar to how liquidity found its way into the MBS market in the past week or so to the tune of $1.4 trillion. That happened. We also have dry, dry powder available to add to equities in the event we do get a retest or lower in coming weeks and months, but that appears to be a lower probability at this point. If the facts change, we'll adjust and be ready to take advantage, but for the time being, the bulk of the opportunities in selective basket of researched individual distre distressed credit securities, as was our repeated plan in the previous four weeks of buying equities, the highest quality equities on every red down day and sitting on our hands on green days, we followed and will follow the same template in the high yield credit markets. So that was just tying a bow on that. Howard Marks. Uh, the other thing we emphasized in the last two weeks is banks, which had a monster week this week. We were saying that they were at their lowest, most underweight from the uh, Bank of America survey. That uh, what happened the last time that happened in July of 2016 was they doubled over the next 18 months. We weren't saying that was going to happen, but the odds favored a good move. Well, we started to get it. And Wells Fargo got the green light to make the small business loans. There had been a cap from the crisis. That cap was taken off. That's going to help their earnings power, as well as the origination fees of 1% to 5% on all of these new government loans, which we discussed in last week's video cast. Earnings, we only did one sector this week. Materials fell uh, for 2020, 11.88% in the last 60 days. Again, these numbers are going to continue to get worse. Market's already discounting that. We had to use your Denny this week for uh, S&P because uh, FactSet didn't put out their note this week because of the holiday, but he's at 156.88 for 2020. It's probably still a little bit high, but it gives you an idea, but still 182 for 2020. And if you do the math, uh, we're low. I don't see a major reason why that should be tremendously impaired for 2021 if with all the stimulus, but uh, we'll take it day by day. The last thing on the health front, which I thought was critical, was Dr. Fauci was on CNN this morning, and he said the key factor for getting back to work in coming maybe weeks, we will see, okay, is the antibody test. These are IgG tests. It's going to be a finger prick, blood finger prick. It basically tells you if you've already been exposed or you already had it and you didn't know it, which means you'll be able to go back to work because the incidence of re- uh, getting it again is very low, and there's so many asymptomatic, a, uh, asymptomatic people that we may find that 60, 70 percent of the population has already had it, in which case we can go back to work much more quickly, or at the very least, if it's only 20, 30 percent, at least those people can go back to work with relative safety, um, and the shock of today, shock meaning good news, was that uh, he said that the antibody test, IgG test for novel coronavirus could be available within a week or so. They're cheap, they're plentiful, they just have to be produced. And that was really a game changer if that's the case, because that enables us to open the economy probably a lot sooner than ever expected. So that's it for this week. We went through a lot because there was a lot. Um, but uh, hope you found that helpful. And we'll see you back next week, same time, same place. If you celebrate Easter, have a happy Easter. For those of you who had Passover, hope you had a happy Passover. And for those of you who don't celebrate or have other holidays, have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Uh, I know some people, you know, are still having a real tough time with this. I, you know, the government money's on the way. I think we'll be able to turn this around sooner than later. Hang tight. Um, uh, it will get better from here. Have a great week, everyone.